This may be the only planet in the universe that contains eyes to see it, brains to think about it, and wonder about it. I don't believe that. I suspect that there is plenty of life in the universe, but this is the only kind of life that we know about. The laws of physics apply all over the universe, and the laws of physics are never violated by life. Nevertheless, something very strange happens wherever there's life. The laws of physics are channeled through a very odd process, which was first discovered by the man whose birthday we've just celebrated, uh, Charles Darwin. Life, to me, I would identify as anything which is highly statistically improbable, but in a specified direction. You have to add that specified direction because uh, with hindsight you could say that any old heap of rubbish is statistically improbable in the sense that there's never been another heap of rubbish exactly the same. What's special about, about life is that living things are statistically improbable in a direction which you could have specified in advance. It's not always exactly the same, but birds are good at flying, fish are good at swimming, moles are good at digging, etc. All living things are good at something, whereas lumps of rock aren't. What exactly living things are good at, we learn from Darwin and his successors. They're good at surviving, but there's a little bit more to it than that. It's not just that they're good at surviving as individuals, they're good at passing on the coded information that built them in the first place. Natural selection is the royal road to complexity from simple beginnings. We know of no other way, and I, indeed I'll stick my neck out and say there is no other way in which the powerful illusion of purpose which living things show could have come about. Once Darwinian natural selection has given rise to living things which have brains or some sort of uh, data processing machinery, it then becomes possible that purpose is no longer an illusion purpose then becomes actually a product of brains or whatever substitute for brains might exist on other planets. Lawrence began by mentioning some other things which, have, which apparently have some of the properties of life. He mentioned forest fires. Um, I can tell you very simply what's wrong with that. Um, forest fires do indeed reproduce in the sense that Lawrence meant, in that um, you've got a forest fire here, and then a spark or a flying piece of fire goes up into the, into the air and is carried by the wind, lands somewhere else in the forest and starts a new fire. So there is reproduction among fires, but it's not true reproduction in the genetic sense, and here's very precisely why. It would be true reproduction, or true replication, I should say, if the qualities of a fire were carried in the spark that initiates it. So if you could imagine that um, there's a bit of fire over, over here which has a sort of bluish tinge because maybe there's some copper in the soil or something like that, and the spark flies across to another part of the forest, if that bluish tinge were inherited by the daughter fire, then that would indeed be a true analogy for, uh, for genetics. Um, but that doesn't happen. The qualities of a fire are given to it by the local environment, by the quality of the trees, by the soil, or whatever it might be. It is not carried in the spark. And that's what gives life its very, very peculiar property. It is the spark that travels from one fire to the next. It is the genes that travel from one organism to the next that carry that part of the attributes of the organism that matter for evolution and evolution is what matters for producing the complexity and the um, illusion of purpose that characterizes life. Crystals 
have some properties that resemble living things. They can be very beautiful, very elegant, um, very perfect shapes. And if you wander into a cave full of crystals, you might even think that you had wandered into a living zoo. But crystals don't have this singular property of reproduction in the precise way I've indicated, with genetic information being carried from one generation to the next. But, you might well say, aren't I just describing the way life is on this planet? How do we know that this, that this would be the property of life if we were to discover it on another planet? Well, we don't know that. Um, but I'm, this is almost an article of faith. I would, I would stick my neck out and say that there is only one way for this property of complexity, this um, uh, illusion of design in specified directions, purposeful directions, pseudo-purposeful directions can come about, and that is by natural selection, which is the non-random survival of randomly varying self-replicating information. When one says randomly varying, that only means that it varies in a direction which is not specifically aimed towards improvement in the way that evolution is. The reason why evolution ends up with an improved result, with a more complex result, with a result that flies better, swims better, digs better, or whatever it is, is that these random changes are cumulative over many generations. So in any one generation, you just call it random. But when you stack up a whole series of generations of these improvements, um, which are improvements by definition because they survive, then you end up with highly complicated machines like eyes which resemble cameras or telescopes, like ears, like elbows, um, like kidneys, and so on. There seems to be no obvious limit to the complexity which this Darwinian algorithm is capable of generating. Uh, it's generated us. It's generated us who have brains capable of looking around, reflecting on our existence, wondering about our existence, and finally, in 1859, solving the riddle of our existence.